I was waiting a month ago for something successful that didn't happen and we're very disappointed. So I guess in, in, in light of that, certainly it is really interesting actually to uh, suddenly have all this commercial interest now and, you know, NASA's now paying others to land rovers, which is absolutely fascinating. I think it is kind of groundbreaking or maybe lunar breaking. Yeah, <laughs> I think it's kind of quite amazing actually. Nice pun there. Well, talk uh, us through uh, what can we expect to happen tomorrow if if it goes ahead successfully? Well, the best part is people can actually watch it. So you can watch it on the NASA TV channel or their streaming or their app. So you can actually watch it. Uh, my advice would be to tune in about an hour before it lands. So it's due to land at 9.30 tomorrow morning, Melbourne time. And about an hour before it lands, it's going to enter this special orbit. So right now it's going around about 91 kilometres above the lunar surface. And in at an hour before it lands, it's going to sort of do this weird orbit, actually. It's going to go into this sort of um, the orbit that takes us 100, kilo 100 kilometres away from the surface at its furthest point, but then 10 kilometres from the surface sort of above where it's going to land. And then so it'll do that for a little bit. And then it's going to slow down, everyone, from 1,800 metres per second to one metre per second before touching down. So it'll do that with these sort of um, with its engines. And the cool thing in it as well is it's got cameras and lasers and an onboard computer to sort of make sense of the information and guide it to a safe spot, which is a little bit like what the Japanese Japanese did just recently with their smart lander for investigating moon or slim and then they have to wait 15 seconds and then control will confirm that there's a touchdown so it'll be very exciting okay but I, I sense that you're cautiously optimistic here what could possibly go wrong because of course this isn't the first attempt to carry out a lunar landing and previous ones as you mentioned by other firms have failed as recently as a month ago yeah Absolutely. And also, of course, so that was Astrobotics uh, Peregrine a month ago, which didn't even really make it there. So it suffered a bit of a fuel leak uh, as it launched. And then it, it sort of they made the decision to bring it back and crash it back into Earth 10 days after launch. Uh, we saw Israel's Bereshit. It actually crashed into the surface uh, in 2019. And Japan's Hakuto R crashed in April last year. So um, the numbers should tell you it, it's difficult to land on the moon. It's not the same as Earth, obviously. It hasn't got the same sort of air or atmosphere. It's it's dusty, it's rocky, it's ragged. It doesn't have the same gravity. It's really difficult to land on the moon, So especially when it's so far away. So essentially this is a robot doing its thing and you can't sort of say, no, wait, just stop, because there's just no time to send that sort of message in the sort of split seconds we're talking about here. I mean, even if you look at Slim, which they managed to talk to at the end of January, that actually landed successfully but landed kind of upside down so it's it's not simple um, and lots and lots of things can go wrong so yeah well if it odyssey uh, does land the right way up and it is successful <laughs> uh, what exactly is its mission once it lands Right, so it's heading to the South Pole in a sort of crater called, near a crater called Malapert A, and that's about 300 kilometres from the South Pole. Uh, on board, it has six instruments from NASA that are kind of aiming to sort of look at how the environment is on the moon. So there's actually a camera that's going to look at the dust that gets thrown up when it lands, which is important for when, you know, NASA starts with its Artemis mission. They want to know what it's like when, when um, we've got landing of structures, as uh, landing of uh, spacecraft next to structures or next to other spacecraft. So we really need to know what the dust is going to do. Um, essentially, uh, just getting ready to, to occupy, really, to get there on the moon, have a sustained presence. And the reason they're in the South Pole, Yvonne, which a lot of people will be wondering, is that's where, to quote The Water Boy, which is a movie from my past, a long time ago, Adam Sandler, um, it's quality H2O. In fact, it's some of the only water you can really find on the moon, and that's something we really, really need. It's in these craters that kind of have these shadows that don't really see the sun. So so we're looking for ice water, basically. OK, so all of this is in the name of research in, in to inform future missions. When can we expect the next crewed moon landing, do you think? And which country is likely to make that happen oh. first? Oh, that's a can great a question. Call? So, uh, <laughs> look, it's going to be the US or China. I'm going to not very much hedge my bets. I think that's going to be it. But uh, we're sort of looking at Artemis. Um, so this is the first one, really, of a paid mission from NASA for Artemis. Uh, and we're going to hopefully see astronauts uh, sort of do a, a flyby or, or go around the moon um, in 2026, I think. And they're saying end of 2020. 
uh, NASA are. But then uh, China has also come out and said, we, we aim for 2030, uh, which I'm, I'm not sure that's it's about a year of on, so I'm not sure. The thing is that uh, ultimately, Yes, there's a lot of glory and pride in getting there first for the for the last um, 50 years, because of course in 1972 Apollo 17 was the last uh, crewed mission there. Uh, there's a lot of pride and glory. There's also something to be said about ruling the roost and and having a seat at the table. In fact, having the big head honcho seat at the table. But also NASA are not going to. They've said this repeatedly. They're not going to send things or launch things that are just not ready. Um, it's a lot a lot of money, um, $118 million USD, US dollar contract for this particular mission. But when NASA were doing it themselves, uh, there were estimates of between $500 million and a billion US dollars. So we're talking big, big, big money here, and it's not worth making a mistake. Um, on the other hand, you know, Odysseus, of course, was the Greek hero that, uh, you know, came back after 10 years after the Trojan War. And of course, he came home to Ithaca to reclaim his um, his seat on the throne as king of Ithaca. So, so maybe that's what Odysseus is doing uh, on the moon. But I think it's too soon to tell. Mm. Well, just a final question. You mentioned the cost of how much these space missions uh, are. Why is NASA turning to private firms to help with its experiments? Is there a clue there? Well, absolutely. I mean, it's a saving for them and the government. It's it's less risk just for them. It's also a little bit less difficult to ask the public, essentially, to fund, I think. Um, there's also shared risk in, in terms of personnel. Uh, and also there's, it drives innovation, you know. We've seen, we've seen all these amazing innovative designs come out of, I suppose, um, SpaceX and, and you've got, you know, your Virgin Galactic, you've got all these amazing different ways now that, that sort of civilians are getting into space. And competition really does drive uh, technical and industrial research and innovation. Um, but it does actually open some questions about, you know, well, who controls that space and, and you know what's the legal framework is there any can we make any and then does it make it difficult if we're also negotiating with um, individual commercial enterprises which I think are very very important questions that we need to answer soon. Mm. Who controls space as well I guess that's that's a big question. Claire Kenyon yeah. thanks so much for talking to us really appreciate it. Just lastly uh, what time should we uh, pay attention tomorrow for the landing? So it's due to land at about 9.30 tomorrow Melbourne, Melbourne time uh, in the morning. Okay. If you wanted to have a look at NASA TV any time from sort of, I reckon, 8 o'clock or 8.30 when it starts to do its little fun descent would be a good time to tune in. Claire, thanks so much. Really appreciate your time. Thanks, Yvonne.